welcome everyone. It's good to see uh, uh, this audience uh, with lots of old friends. I noticed that there are several people today who have not been here before, and there was some question about what this series is about. So I just take a minute before I introduce Partho, our speaker, to explain that this series was started surprisingly now about four years ago. I never imagined that it could possibly continue for so long because it was started as an exercise about five, six years ago amongst architects to sit together and um, to, to, uh, to discuss their problems of the profession and things like that. And um, outside the kind of, not the practical problems of every everyday profession, but rather larger issues of the profession. And after a while, people felt that, you know, it wasn't just enough to sit together and uh, uh, exchange notes about what was wrong with things or not. And that we ought to invite people to speak. I just wanted to say that this, then as a result, we decided that we would have architecture and society as a theme. And uh, we'd have one every month. And we'd ask people, and we've had a lot of young academics, a lot of, uh, not just architects, a lot of people from the arts, and humanities who have come in and have actually given a talk. And surprisingly, we've had now, this is I think the 47th or 48th talk. So that means four years, huh? uh, 12 into four is, yeah, four years. And uh, which is quite surprising. Yeah, very nice. No, yes, yeah, we can, we can do that for them. But uh, glad for the audience that the people actually turn out. And uh, which means that even society, civil society, is rather concerned about architecture. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Uh, should be, but you know, surprising to know that. I mean, that's why the Architects Act was set up uh, to protect civil society from the profession. <laughs> actually. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the, 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 to regulate the profession, you know, for that. And thank goodness they haven't been able to regulate it, like most things in our country, unregulatable. So, but having said that, I want to introduce Partho Datta, who's been very kind to come today and um, tell us about his researches into the work of uh, Patrick Geddes, which has, of, I think, of great significance to the profession and, in fact, to our understanding of cities. Uh, but I will not say anything further. Partho teaches at the JNU in the Department of Art and Aesthetics. Called, and uh, has been uh, a friend of the series. He's come, come and uh, attended many of the talks, but haven't spoken before. So I welcome Partho, and I will leave him now to give you his talk. I'll join him. Ganju for inviting me to this talk and uh, a month ago I just heard a wonderful talk in this series by the architect Swati Janmu and uh, she was talking about working with uh, uh, artisanal communities in Delhi, some of whom actually live under flyovers and building housing units for them. And at the end of the talk uh, somebody in the uh, audience said, you know these small little efforts that you make does it really matter in the end? Because it doesn't change anything. Um, well, uh, so that's a question, and uh, I think it has some <coughs> affinities to Geddes, because uh, what I'm going to argue and what I'm going to say is that Geddes always uh, promoted and uh, talked about the small scale in, a, in planning and architecture. Uh, that's one thing that I want to keep, want all of you to keep in mind. Now, um, Get is, uh, so let me just tell you, uh, it's very difficult when I was preparing this talk that, you know, I don't know why I gave this title because it's really, it's a big <coughs> um, The point is, obviously I can't tell you everything about Get is. I've been interested in Get is for a long time. And uh, so this is a sympathetic account of Get is. Uh, you could also do a critical account of Get is. So this is not a critical account. And uh, it's sympathetic because uh, he, I think he was an important thinker. 
he was uh, he certainly uh, uh, critiqued mainstream planning and he certainly provided alternatives if we look at him critically then uh, we know that some of his out ideas have become outdated uh, some of his models don't work uh, he was very scatty uh, his, uh, uh, he wrote lots of reports, most of which people don't read any longer. They are actually quite difficult to read. He wrote one book in his life, uh, in the beginning of the First World War, uh, called uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Cities in Evolution, 1915. So he wrote it just before the First World War was there. It's completely unreadable. And uh, it's very turgid and, uh, uh, you know, so one really has to look for, uh, uh, you know, this really is, so, you know, it's quite, it's a quite a difficult job actually getting it all together. <laughs> anyway, but let me try and present, yeah. I do want to say that, I just want to acknowledge that I had, 25 years ago when I began uh, uh, my PhD uh, on urban planning, I uh, hadn't even heard of Geddes. And the person who introduced it, uh, me to Geddes was my teacher, Professor Narayani Gupta, who is here. Uh, and uh, I just, because she's always enthused about Geddes, and uh, that's one of the reasons I've followed it. The other person who has uh, written uh, very interestingly on Geddes, and, and still enthuses about him, is the historian and author Ramachandra Guha. I don't know if, uh, if you've any, he's, written, he's written a couple of essays, uh, which are certainly worth reading. And also in Delhi, although I don't know him personally, Professor Shiv Vishwanathan has also written some excellent essays on Geddes, and I've drawn on it. That's why I want to, I want to, uh, wanted to tell you this right in the beginning. Okay, so um, let's have a look at what Geddes. So that's Patrick Geddes for you. Uh, it's a picture uh, from, uh, and you can see his dates. Uh, uh, so he's very much a 19th century man. His ideas came from the late part of the 19th century. He died in 1932. It's important for us because uh, between 1914 and 1924, intermittently for 10 years, uh, he was in India. Um, so that's why we, I, I, I find it, it's particularly relevant for Indian planning. Uh, I want to flag two things right in the beginning. One is that he was Scottish. This is very important because, uh, so therefore he was anti-British. He was anti-imperialist, he was very sympathetic to uh, Indian nationalists. Uh, that is, the, you must keep this in mind. He was, uh, you know, he had lots of Indian friends. He wrote the biography of the Indian scientist Jagadish Bose. Rabindranath Tagore was a great friend. Uh, and he came to India with great expectations. The second thing, and this is certainly important since there are so many architects and planners present here, he was a biologist and he was a sociologist. Uh, he was not an architect or a urban planner in the sense that we think about it today. Please keep this in mind because this is one of the reasons uh, why uh, Geddes has fallen out of the map is precisely, I think, because of this. But I'll, I'll talk about this in, in some detail a little more. Okay. Uh, by one count, he wrote 40 town plans for India. Most of them are inaccessible now. It's a little misleading. You can see I've made a list here for you, not all the 40, obviously. Uh, I haven't read all the 40 either. But it, it's a little misleading because some of these reports were only two pages. Some of them were two fact volumes, uh, particularly his famous Indoor report. Luckily, this Indoor report has come out in an edition now. Not one, but two editions have come out, one from England and one from uh, uh, somebody called, I don't know him personally, Abhilash Khandekar from Indoor has republished the famous Indoor report. So uh, why is this significant? Um, uh, what is so significant about these uh, reports? Uh, as you can see that they are not about, and this is the first point, they're not about the big metropolises. Uh, they're about uh, princely capitals, they're about smaller towns, and they're about suburbs. Even today, uh, urban studies certainly, you know, ignores uh, second tier cities. Uh, and uh, so therefore, uh, uh, Geddes' reports are a very valuable record and an ethnography of these cities in the early 20th century. That's the first point. The second point is uh, to do with uh, generation uh, uh, of ideas about the city in, uh, uh, um, in the early 20th century. 
And this has something to do with uh, the colonial mindset. We usually think that all the significant ideas about cities have come from the Euro-American tradition. Uh, that it's the metropolis which sort of innovates ideas and then they uh, come to the colonies. Actually, Geddes' work shows that very significant ideas about modern urbanism were generated in the colony. We must keep this in mind, and that's one of the reasons why I find that Geddes is uh, very relevant today. Now let me tell you uh, very briefly uh, what I'm going to do in this talk. Uh, I've divided it into three sections. Uh, the first one, uh, I'm going to uh, address why Geddes eclipsed from planning history. I have some ideas and I'm going to speculate on it. Uh, the second part, I'll very, very briefly tell you about his stay in India, uh, what he did, uh, what he actually confronted, uh, and that's the, how, by the reasons uh, he wrote these plans. And thirdly, uh, I'll tell you in the last part of the talk, uh, some of his ideas about planning. Most of them were not implemented, unfortunately. And these will be four areas at this time. One will be about circulation. The other one will be about everyday spaces. The third will be about housing. And the fourth will be about waste in the city. So these are four areas which I will, I've just chosen them. Uh, I find them, the, he talks about many other things also. But. So let me uh, first uh, talk about why did Geddes eclipse? Or well, why am I talking about this in the beginning? Um, well, it tells us something about how planning histories are written. That's the first thing. I'm a, a historian by training, so I'm very used to doing historiographies. I'm very interested. Why is that Geddes never figures in, in standard planning histories? But it also tells us what Geddes is not when we actually look at this tradition of writing. Uh, the first thing, usually uh, planning histories are about the master plan and about the authoritative planner. Sometimes I would say the authoritarian planner. Uh, um, and uh, Geddes uh, uh, just doesn't fit this model at all. Uh, in fact, Ram Goa has said, and he puts it very beautifully, he says Geddes' approach was cautious and piecemeal. So let me just leave it here. I'll just come to it again when I talk about it in a little more detail. Secondly, for the master plan to succeed, you need the might of the state behind it. And Geddes rejected the state. In fact, his most famous disciple, Louis uh, Mumford, uh, says that Geddes rejected the cult of the state. I'll leave it there. I hope it will become clear when I, when I sort of slightly develop it a little more. Thirdly, it's not that all master plans are made with bad faith. There is some good faith in it also. Let me just give you an example. I was very struck by this. A few years before Charles Correa died, he gave an interview. I have a copy of it. He was talking to a newspaper. And there he was lamenting. He said, the great tradition of uh, architect planners who, talk, who thought about the social and about housing for the laboring poor has just disappeared. And the three people he mentioned in this interview were, of course, the great Mies van der Rohe, uh, Le Corbusier, and Frank, Frank, Lloyd, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and he said, look, this tradition, even they were thinking about this. And clearly, Korea saw himself in this tradition. I was very surprised that he doesn't mention Geddes. Uh, I'm sure he knew about Geddes. And I, I was puzzling as to why didn't he mention it, mention him at all. Um, so, why doesn't Geddes fit that model? Well, I think that Geddes, uh, in his reports, made it clear again and again that uh, all plans, however well-meaning and rational, were an imposition. So, actually, Geddes uh, would have rejected any of them, even if it, is, it was progressive and well-meaning. I hope, again, I'll, I'll tell you about this a little more in, uh, in, through my talk. The most interesting thing about Geddes, and one of the reasons that he is eclipsed, is actually a political one, uh, which is that he had no truck with the left. That is the left wing, political left wing. It's, it's, I'll, that also I will tell you as by and by in my talk. In fact, he was contemptuous of the ideas of revolution. 
Uh, the person who has written about this is Louis Mumford, uh, his most famous disciple. And uh, uh, Geddes' uh, uh, idea was that uh, what will the Marxist revolution do? It says that the working classes should occupy the property of the rich, meaning the houses of the rich. But for in, the important question that Geddes was asking was, uh, but do we really want to occupy the houses of the rich? What are the norms of space there? Uh, this is just an inversion. Let me uh, just, uh, and uh, Mumford actually used to quote this. Uh, this was a, uh, something Gettys used to say again and again. He used to say, uh, slum, semi-slum, and super slum, to this has come the evolution of cities. It's there in, this, in the city in history where Louis Mumford is quoted two or three times. Uh, I want to make it clear that, uh, let me just clarify what he meant by slum. We know that slum is a uh, colonial category uh, which is imbued with a pathology. I don't think Geddes meant slum like that at all. What he meant was that these were spaces generated by modern architecture and housing which had systematically and mechanically eliminated small communal spaces. So his idea was that what we really have to strive for is humane and communal forms of norms for space, rather than just occupying the uh, houses of the rich. In fact, according to uh, uh, Geddes, uh, it's the rich who live in slums, and uh, not the poor. And we don't want that kind of slummy development in our cities. Okay, so that finishes the first part of my talk. Now let me tell you a little bit about his ideas of the city. What were uh, his? Uh, where, what were the roots of his ideas? His ideas didn't drop from the sky. Obviously, uh, he was. Uh, he, there are lots of affinities with other thinkers from the late 19th and early 20th century. Again, I find it very puzzling that uh, in planning histories, this connection hasn't been made. Uh, so. Uh, Two thinkers, uh, um, in which with whom uh, Geddes was in some kind of intellectual dialogue, and with one with whom he was very influenced by. Um, I'm talking of planners. Uh, uh, one was the Austrian planner Camillo Sitter, uh, who worked for Vienna, and uh, I think there is an affinity there because Sitter actually rejected uh, uh, the Euclidean norms of planning. It was the non-geometric in, in the design of the cities that uh, really uh, was the one that the uh, city actually brought out. The second and more importantly was uh, Ebenezer Howard, the, uh, the famous garden city plan. And there is no doubt that Geddes was very influenced by that, or at least in dialogue with it. And then, as we know that Howard's uh, idea was that the, about the futility of sustaining big cities through improved utilities. So basically what he wanted was, uh, what Howard wanted was that we should build smaller communities, uh, and of course they would be green communities. There would be much more integration with nature. Uh, in fact, uh, if you read Geddes, uh, he uh, obviously supported this, and uh, he was very fond of course, co uh, quoting one of the thinkers that Geddes himself was very influenced by the 19th century uh, English thinker John Ruskin he used to say, it's there in Cities in Evolution, it's in all his reports. He says, the field should ga gain on the street and not the street on the field. That was the mantra with which uh, Geddes Ged Ged was working. Uh, so inherent in Geddes' thought is a critique of the big city. Uh, there are some terms that uh, Geddes invented, neologisms, which we now use, but actually Geddes uh, invented them. For instance, the term megalopolis, which is, of course, built in it is a critique of the big city. The term conurbation, and thirdly, the term war cities. This was the city. This was his uh, description of cities uh, like Berlin and London and Paris. Uh, war cities, because he said these big megalopolises are run by bureaucratic and military elites. He didn't want this model. He said, we will just have to move away from it. The second very important influence uh, uh, on 
Geddes was of Darwin. As I said, he was a 19th century man. He was a Darwinist, there's no doubt about it. He's openly said so. Uh, uh, his book was called Cities in Evolution. Uh, but he was a critical uh, Darwinist, a critical evolutionist. And his argument was that evolution uh, is not always progressive. So that's where planning actually comes. We have to give it direction. And, uh, and obviously, it, it's applied to cities also. Um, importantly, uh, so for instance, the Industrial Revolution was an, uh, was uh, was a uh, was a, a evolution. It was uh, it was certainly an evolution for human society. But according to Geddes, uh, the Industrial Revolution uh, had not taken into account the biological circumstances of human beings. This mad rush for production of, uh, had actually played havoc with nature. So pollution, smoke, and you know, the, the big 19th century European capitals, uh, uh, industrial capitals. He said, you know, so they had exploited nature. According to Geddes, of course he had an idea on it. He said that we can move away from this as we have cleaner energies. Uh, uh, um, uh, Ramgoa therefore says, uh, and rightly so I think, that Geddes actually anticipated environmentalism. Uh, he was also an environmental thinker. And what he said, and what Geddes said, was that, um, uh, that the, um, what 19th century rampant industrialism had done to cities, and I quote him, he said that they had actually hidden the grand design of the cities of the past. Now, what did he mean by this grand design? He actually meant, uh, <coughs> the way uh, cities, uh, the form of the city, uh, which came about because of the circulation of people and of commerce. I'll come to this point, I'll explain to him when I look, when you look at his ideas. <laughs> to, so basically, for him, the idea was to uh, recover and unravel this grand, grand, grand design of the city. And uh, he uh, made up, he sort of, uh, sort of innovated a method and this method he called the diagnostic survey. And I want to explain this to you, what he means by this. Uh, it was a working method, let's put it like this. It was not a model. I, I want to underline this. It was not a model at all. First, uh, uh, the, let me talk about the survey method. What did he mean by this? When he talked about survey, it's very interesting. He actually... Um, rejected the standard planning practice of planners, which is the sheet, the sheet of paper on which you draw the plan. Uh, why did he reject it? Uh, he said the plan uh, makes all space uniform. This is a problem. And uh, worse, uh, on the plan, uh, spaces have to be represented and the poor never get represented in these plans. In fact, if you look at 19th century maps, the large empty spaces in the, in the maps are actually the housing settlements of the poor. So he, was, he just didn't want to do this. So he says the only way to do is to go down on your knees or actually walk around the city and map it. Modern uh, post-colonial historians call this cartographic disenfranchisement. So, uh, um, this was the Gagadisian method. There is, uh, there is a wonderful, uh, you know, Gagadis's reports, uh, I've read some of them, I'm lucky to have read some of them. And the Indo report is now in print, which everybody should read, certainly. Uh, it, they're all dialogic. Uh, they'll, they'll ask a question and then he'll answer it. I think this was the method of 19th century uh, writing. Uh, but, uh, so he says, uh, uh, in, uh, rhetorically, in the, Indo, in the Indo report, he says, uh, who uh, knows the city the best? Uh, he's talking about his survey method. He says, actually, it's the postman, the tongawala, and the policeman. And then he asks rhetorically, he says, then what am I doing there? If they know the city better than me, because they walk around and obviously know the place. He says, my plan as a, plan, as a, as a planner, uh, my, my work as a planner, is that I connect the past to the present. I would add that he, he, what he meant was he would connect the past, the present, and the future. That's what he really wanted to do. Uh, a little bit about
about. So this was his survey method, uh, which he had innovated a little bit about uh, the other part, which is called he called it the diagnostic survey. What is this? Was this diagnosis? What is this diagnosis? This actually came from a kind of organicism, which came from Darwinism actually. His idea was that the city was like an organism, and the metaphor for the city was, of course, the social body. You know. Uh, and his idea was that the growth of the city should be like a natural outgrowth. And planning, when it has to happen, uh, has to be integrated into the geographical and the uh, cultural environment in such a way that planning would become invisible. You would actually, wouldn't actually be able to see it. There is a, a postmodern scholar in MIT, a um, planning historian called Arindam Datta. Some of you may know about his work. He's written on Geddes also. He says, uh, interestingly, that Geddes wanted to plan cities in a way where the plan would actually disappear. Now, so these are, uh, this was his method by which we approach cities. Now let's look at what did he do with it when he actually came to India. What did he confront uh, when, he, when he comes to India? In fact, uh, I have to mention, because this is another professor who so happens that he comes to Delhi now, Professor Ray Bromley uh, from the University of Albany in New York, who's written uh, two or three years ago a very interesting book on uh, Geddes. And I've taken some of his ideas from his book. He, he points out that Geddes actually had no ready-made models. Uh, he actually came to India to discover new models. That's, uh, so it was there for him and he went around and then he offered some solutions. Uh, when he came to India, two things happened to him. One was that he met, met Indian intellectuals and he was stunned. If you read his letters, and no time to quote his letters, wonderful letters, uh, uh, he met a range of people and uh, he, you know, he was, he, he felt really, it was very heartening for him to actually meet. So he, so too, of course he met Gandhi uh, and became a great friend of Rabindranath Tagore. And uh, he was, um, uh, and I told you that he wrote the biography of the scientist Jagadish Bose, who was also a biologist. So there was an affinity there. Uh, Tagore and he became great friends. And of course, there was some mutual back scratching. They sort of admired each other. Let me just show you this. Uh, this is Geddes writing, uh, Tagore writing on Geddes. Uh, he says, he has the precision of the scientist. It's a tribute. Uh, the vision of the prophet and like great artists is able to convey his ideas through the language of symbols. Uh, so Geddes found a home in, uh, in India. The second thing was that he discovered the Indian urban traditions, uh, which is of course there in his plans. He talks about he began from South India, and again he was absolutely awestruck by the uh, architectural traditions of the South. He wrote a superb essay, which is certainly worth rereading re again, called The Temple Towns of India. It was published in this very famous early 20th century Indian magazine called The Modern Review. Um, it's in print, you can find it. You should, you should definitely, I won't talk about it. But then he moved up north. And uh, I'll just tell you what impressed him most, and he thought the Euro-American tradition had lost this, was the functional traditions of Indian architecture, uh, which is the use of local material, uh, the adaption to climate, the multiple use of public spaces, the small grain character of the street. He wanted to bring all of this into planning. Let me show you. the small green character of the street. This is from one of uh, a book on Geddes, which was edited after he died. This is actually Calcutta. Uh, what did he see? What was happening? Some planning was happening in, in, in India uh, when he came in the early 20th century. Uh, there were three kinds of people working here and planning cities. There were sanitarians, there were demolitionists, and there were people who built imperial capitals. 
And two of the greatest planning commissions in the world ever were happening at the time when, in the early 20th century. One was the building of New Delhi, huge amounts of money. And another, which people don't talk about that much, was the planning of Calcutta, the Calcutta Improvement Trends. Huge amounts of money. Every inch of Calcutta was planned. The Calcutta that we see today is a legacy of the Calcutta Improvement Trust. It's interesting, they actually, both these models uh, actually tell us about how planning happened. And one was you intervene into the city, which is what happened in Calcutta, completely restructure it. The other is New Delhi, which is you escape the city altogether and you build a new. Gedis rejected both these plans. He, had, he didn't want to have anything to do with them. He, he tried to get some commissions from them because he wanted to earn some money, but he rejected it. He made it quite obvious even before coming to India that he'll have nothing to do with Lachance's plan. Uh, what was his idea? He said, this is just imperial conceit, and the ideas of neoclassicism are just jaded. They may be very beautiful, but you know they're just jaded. <coughs> Lachance knew about it, and he hated Geddes. Hmm. He called him a crank, in fact, and saw to it that nobody or any of Geddes' disciples ever got near the New Delhi commissions. Hmm. Uh, what repelled him about Calcutta, the Calcutta Improvement Trust model? The enormous financial and social costs. Uh, by 1927, uh, the, the Hausmannian restructuring of Calcutta, about 50,000 people had been displaced. And, and uh, Kedis would have nothing to do with this. So, more importantly, he was repelled by the statism of both these plans. He said, this is not the way planning should really go. Let me... Um, what a letter, uh, lovely letter he writes because it has some resonance even today. It's a letter he writes from Bellari uh, to his daughter, I think. He says, he's writing about, he was trying to do something there and they were not allowing him to plan the way he wanted with the, with the local municipality. He says, here it is to be with the sanitary authority of the Madras government. This is, remember, this is Madras presidency at that time. With its death dealing housemanizing and its squalid bylaws which it thinks, enacts, and enforces as up-to-date planning. And for the least infraction of these mean straight lines, it scolds, abuses, and delays this poor municipality. And at length, not only bullies, but threatens it with extinction altogether. From the callous, contemptuous city bureaucrat at Delhi, I have now to tackle here the well-intentioned fanatic of sanitation perhaps even a tougher proposition. This callous bureaucrat at Delhi, I think we all know, I mean, it was even there in 1940. Okay. Now, let me uh, discuss some of his ideas. Uh, what were the uh, uh, solutions that he, that he offered? So first, let me uh, tell you about uh, his, as I said, I've just chosen four, but there are many. Uh, the first one I'll talk about is circulation. I told you that when he was talking about the grand design of cities, uh, what he meant was uh, the, the form that the city takes because of the circulation of people and commerce. Uh, and his thing was that we have to discover this. Uh, and, uh, and he writes in Cities in Evolution in his book that it's the post-railway age which had actually covered this up. He said, if you want to revive our cities, we, we need to, uh, we need to re recover and discover this again. And this, of course, he would do through his ethnography, uh, which he called uh, uh, the Dynamistic Survey. Uh, so what did he discover <coughs> when he started? Uh, firstly, he said, uh, uh, he discovered that the Indian cities, the circulation happened, there were three kinds of uh, uh, people, uh, uh, circulation that was happening. One was pedestrian traffic, uh, second was human portage, and third was animal transport. Uh, 
And of course, he was writing in the tw early 20th century. There was mecha mechanized transport hadn't come in a very big way, but it was coming already. He could see it. It was there. Uh, so his idea was that uh, what we should do is that instead of only only building thoroughfares for just mechanized traffic, thinking about the future, we should have a gradation of roads. This idea, I think, he took partly from the Garden Cities model. It's there. And so you have uh, larger roads for uh, thoroughfares for mechanized traffic, uh, middle-level middle road roads for mixed traffic, and uh, small lanes should be preserved for just pedestrian traffic. He wrote beautifully on pedestrian, uh, uh, on pedestrianization and pedestrians. Let me just quote this. This is, uh, I discovered this in his, uh, in his Calcutta report. It's so beautiful. I have he says, a lane, after all, is a pavement without a road beside it. And some people value its quietness, while its narrow width and shade give coolness also. And uh, this was through his ethnography, which he discovered in Banaras, in the South Indian cities, and in Indore also, in his Indore report. And what he found that modern planning had actually made the cities turn their back to the river. And why did he emphasize the river so much? Because he found that the river itself was one of the major thoroughfares in Indian cities. It has always been. So uh, we have, so his idea was that these cities should be oriented back towards wherever there are water bodies or rivers, it should be oriented back towards it. And again, um, it's very amusing in his, uh, his Calcutta report. Actually, it's not the Calcutta, it's called the Bada Bazaar report, which is, uh, he says, again, rhetorically, he, uh, he asks this question. He says, uh, uh, he, he says, what do Calcuttans do when they get up first thing in the morning? He said, they actually walk to the ghats to take a dip, to take a bath. And he says, if you look at any map of Calcutta, it's true, even if you look at it today, the fine vein of lanes all actually go from the west to the east. That is, they all move towards the river. But all modern thoroughfares built in Calcutta go north and south. So uh, he says, what's happening? I mean, he said it's not that he was against these thoroughfares. No. He says, but we should revive these, uh, uh, these other forms of circulation in the city also. Of course, uh, this reorientation towards the river had other implications that we know. I mean, in tropical countries, it's uh, Water bodies are always very important. Um, uh, river sites or banks are important culturally, aesthetically, and so on. So those things he wrote about in a way. Okay, so that was his uh, way of discovering the grand design of cities, which he wanted to unravel. Let me um, tell you about the next thing that he tackled, and that was housing. It's very very important. Here again, there was some tussle with the left wing. It's very interesting. And again, here is ethnography was very important. By ethnography, it was not that he just walked around with a stick in his hand all over the city, but he actually tried to look at everything, at maps, at censuses, at reports. He talked to people. Uh, he, uh, he discovered uh, a very important point. He said, housing is closely tied to ownership of property. It's absolutely crucial. Who is the largest owner of property in any city? In Indian cities, it was always the state. So he said, we can't run away. Although he was, as I told you, he was anti-statist in some ways. But he said, the state, as far as housing is concerned, has to play a crucial role. There's no question. He asked the next question. He said, after the state, who is the next big landowner in the city? Obviously, it's the business classes. He says, we can't turn our back to, from the business classes. Either we have to take them into partnership. In Calcutta, I won't talk about it. I've written about the, uh, the Calcutta report elsewhere. Uh, he certainly wanted the Marwadis as a partner. And he had some very fascinating plans to do it. His larger idea was that if congested uh, 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 property in the middle of the city is demolished, then, including the houses of the rich, then the people who suffer the most are the laboring poor. 
any housing stock that gets reduced will have a kind of uh, rotor effect. Uh, so he said we should not do this at all. We should not do this at all. And uh, his, uh, so what was the model that he was putting forward? So what's the implication of this? Um, is uh, that he did not want to segregate business and labor in the city, which was really the model of many planners. And he knew what would happen. If you take uh, valuable land in the middle of the city, like they were planning to do in Calcutta, the Bada Bazaar area, the business district, uh, refurbish it, change it, make it clean, sanitized, he said all the rich will escape to uh, posh suburbs and will leave the laboring poor high and dry. He said this model will just not work. We have to work in which there is no segregation between business and labor. That's the only way, one of the ways, not the only way, one way in which uh, uh, housing stock can be saved. To do this, he invented a new value. This is again in his reports. Uh, the new value was uh, that of the family home. And he writes about it in his reports. He said, look, in Europe and America, this tradition is lost. People scoff at the notion. A family home is something that only the very rich have in, uh, the English landowners have, you know. But he says, even the poor in India have a lot of respect and regard for the small houses they own. He said, we should actually invest in that value. And that's where the state will come in. Uh, you know, form banks, you know, subsidize them. We have to keep uh, uh, this, we have to keep this value alive. That's one way of keeping, uh, 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 of, of saving housing stock in the city. Uh, let me give the next quote. He was very skeptical about destroying any kind of housing. I just, this I find it so fascinating. He says, houses were either destroyed or declared insanitary, and I quote, for superficial reasons, so that dirty whitewash, broken plaster, and bad smell are enough to evoke a cry for demolition. So these only need easy cleansing and brightening and economical repair. Uh, we know from the Geddes biography that uh, this, this was not just empty rhetoric. In Edinburgh, before he came to India, he actually moved with his family to the Edinburgh slum, right in the heart of the city, and lived there and practice this. He said, you can actually do it if you just use some, you know, if you are innovative. So uh, his larger argument, therefore, was that if we do this, and I quote him, he said, we will have a satisfied working class. Finally, in the end, that is what he was really uh, sort of, uh, uh, he was really getting at. And the argument that he, and he invented another term, and he called it, conservative surgery. That is, you uh, demolish little to achieve the maximum. I'll leave it here, and I'll move to the next one. Now, uh, his most important contribution, I think, is spaces. Um, what did he do here? He. I think the most important point, the most important contribution of Geddes, in, I'm talking from because it comes in his plans again and again, is that he wanted to sustain uh, the, uh, the ecology of the neighborhood. That was what he was really planning to do. And he wanted to uh, preserve and extend spaces of the everyday. Uh, so for instance, uh, he wanted to, and all through his, his plans are full of this, uh, how to revive and reinvest in spaces like courtyards, rooftops, chabutras, ruaks, you know, in ruaks means the raised plinth outside the house, and so on and so forth. Also social spaces, uh, you know, thresholds, uh, small shrines, trees, water bodies, lanes, cul-de-sacs, street corners, and you'll be surprised, even graveyards. It's wonderful, in the Indore report, uh, he's talking about the Bora community, 
and the Boran community, the women are segregated. They are in Parda. And he says, but they need open spaces. And then he looks at this again, he discovers to his ethnography that the Boras have graveyards which are well looked after. They have shrubs, they have trees. They are secluded. He said, why don't we turn them into gardens? Some of these ideas we know actually came from uh, his reading of uh, a pioneering book written on Mughal gardens by a feminist, a uh, 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 British writer called C. H. Villiers Stewart, The Gardens of the Mughals, and uh, about how the women in the Mughal harem actually produced wonderful spaces, gardens, this whole tradition of writing. And Villiers used this and he writes about this again and again. He says we should have more Parda gardens. Of course, this immediately led to a clash with people who uh, espouse egalitarianism. But Geddes' idea was this, that it's difficult to change society, but, you know, so why don't we preserve the spaces that already exist? And, uh, and rather than having one large park, we can have very many small spaces which are open. That's why he mentioned all these spaces here. Most importantly, and this is a very important uh, principle in his planning ideas, which is that the large uh, open spaces created by modern planners are sanitary voids. They are sanitary voids and they don't work because they need to be policed. Small community spaces are looked after naturally by the community. Let me just show you a picture. Sorry. Here it is. This is from Banaras. So somebody will come and sweep the place, somebody will tend to it, children will play here or something. So this is the kind of space, it's all over in his reports that we really need to preserve and extend. Okay. Now the last part. This is the problem of waste. This is, again, Geddes recognized that this was a political problem. Uh, it's there in his reports. He writes about it. And let me tell you that uh, the connection that we make between uh, caste, exclusion, and waste yeah, the way we do it today now, it's really, it's, we know, the way, every day we read the, open the newspapers, we find five sanitation workers have, as fix, have, you know, have died cleaning drains. It's really terrible. I don't think, uh, frankly, Geddes quite made this connection in his reports, but he was still anticipating this. All in his reports, he is very, very sensitive uh, uh, to this question. In the indoor report, he writes that if we don't look after artisanal communities and workers in the city, then I, quoting him, he says, the city will bleed. So what did he offer as a solution? One was, uh, it was for him, it was, uh, waste was an environmental issue. And he always used to say that, look, what does modern sanitation do? It basically gathers waste through a, uh, a sewerage system and then goes and dumps it somewhere else. It actually pollutes the land further. So this system can't work. It can't work. It's very, very difficult to sustain. Cities can't be sustained like this. Although he doesn't use the word sustain, though, let me tell you. Uh, so what did he offer? He says it can work in the small scale. When the city grows and we have new suburbs, let us try a different experiment. And this is what he did in Indore. He said, what do we find? Most sewer lines actually debouch into the river. He said, let's reverse it. Let the uh, sewage go into land outside the, uh, the, uh, the suburbs, and this will be made into sewage farms. Uh, and then this will turn into manure. These can be made into small gardens, and uh, there'll be vegetables and fruits. And obviously, it can work only for the small scale. And then he had another plan, basically to transform caste. I don't know whether this was a harebrained scheme, but he said now the sanitation workers can become gardeners. They will be tending these these uh, these, uh, these small gardens. Uh, 
okay. So, so what he really was saying is that he wanted to demystify uh, the association of audio with pollution. Since he was a biologist, uh, for him, audio was also life-given. Uh, and it could happen through sewage farms. That's what, that was his idea. And he had lots of conversations with uh, people at this time. There were two very important uh, uh, English uh, um, officials at this time who actually, one was a man called Jay Turner who was writing about uh, sewage farms at this time. And there was another very important sociologist called Harold Mann, a uh, very pioneering sociologist who uh, was also writing on this. And Gedis actually corresponded with them. Um, I just want to end uh, my talk with a small critical note, which is that uh, this celebration of small spaces in Geddes carries with it its own baggage, uh, which is the preservation of the family, the kin, and the community with all its troubling associations. You shouldn't forget that, I think. However, uh, Gates is useful and certainly should matter to us because he brings planning within the realms of the possible. Hi, uh, my name is Onkar Mitra. Uh, thank you for a, a very nice talk. Uh, really enjoyed uh, learning some insights. I mean, into his body of work. Um, you said he's a biologist. Uh, he was a biologist and a sociologist. How did he come to become a planner? Can you shed some light on that? And uh, my second question is that. Uh, uh, of the reports that you mentioned, the Indore report, the Barabaja report, uh, uh, who, who commissioned these and uh, who were his patrons, I mean, who uh, got him to write these reports? And uh, were they implemented in some measure or did they just uh, gather dust? Sorry, what was your first question? That was uh, how did you become a planner? How how become a planner? Okay, so I skipped that bit. It's quite interesting. So, you know, the planning profession, um, I have to tell you, it's only what? Early 20th century. Uh, it's an ensemble. So there are, you know, civil engineers, there are, uh, you know, architects, uh, there are biologists like uh, Geddes, there are uh, uh, bureaucrats, uh, there are authors, there are painters. Uh, one of the per person who took an interest in city planning would be surprised who welcomed uh, Ebenezer Howard's report was Walt Whitman, the American po poet, very famous American. So it was an ensemble. Uh, th so, so the category of planning is a reified category, which emerges only in the early 20th century. And it consolidates itself when it becomes a professional organization. There it happened in 1909, it was a very famous Town Planning Conference in London. It's by the way, it's that's been uh, recently reprinted, and everybody attended it. Geddes attended it, Raymond Unwin attended it, a whole host of people, and then they professionalized. They started bring, bringing out the Town Planning Journal, and then uh, remember, this is the uh, period of of high uh, colonialism. They started lobbying for uh, 
uh, for uh, commissions, and some of the best commissions came from the colonies. That's how the planning profession came, the Western planning profession. I'm amazed that in the Western histories of planning, this connection is never made. There would be no modern planning without the colonies. That's the answer to this. So Vegas comes, all kinds of people were anyway getting interested in it. The second question was, uh, who were the patrons for this? So Geddes was a freelancer. He came to, uh, in, to India because it, in, he was invited by a rather conservative governor of Madras called Lord Pentland, who was interested in some ideas. He brought him to Madras <coughs> first. And then Geddes was free to find work, so he went wherever there was money. And, uh, but the ideas of the city, as I saw, were, were mostly, the ideas were very concretized and uh, they were mostly, uh, how to change cities were mostly run by people who believed in the sanitary principle. So he never got commissions from the government. Uh, so first, his first patrons came from enlightened Maharajas, Baroda and Indore, and then occasionally landlords, like the Balrampur report, who was a big landowner in UP. And then occasionally people uh, with some radical inclinations in municipalities. So, Cal so for instance, in Calcutta, the huge Calcutta Improvement Trust would have nothing to do with Geddes, but the Calcutta Improvement Trust had some rivalry with the Calcutta Municipality. So the Calcutta Municipality took caucus snook at CIT, invited Geddes, and said, why don't you do a small report? That's how the Bada Bazaar report was. I think he asked whether these were implemented. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, mostly no. They were just not implemented. But uh, uh, some of his ideas, so I was telling you about Professor Ray Bromley's new edition of the Indoor Report, his long introduction, where he actually shows that uh, what uh, uh, Geddes actually anticipated about Indoor, how it would actually grow. Uh, uh, has was I turned out to be you know uh, right his 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 his, <laughs> his, uh, uh, his ideas that which which way the city will actually grow and, and uh, so you should look at the introduction so in the sense that uh, the the reports may have anticipated the way the city would actually be uh, uh, will, will will sort of expand but his actual uh, ideas were were not uh, not at all implemented. So for instance, this particular uh, photograph, although it's not from Calcutta, uh, when he suggested this for, uh, this from Banaras, by the way, this photograph is from Banaras. When he said that we should do this for Kolkata, he, uh, the CIT people said, but this is a way of freezing the, uh, of land, uh, you know, uh, uh, so we will not allow it. Uh, this should not be allowed. So there you are. Yeah, none of these things were actually implemented. So that's true of most planning, except the master plans, I think. <laughs> <laughs> was the Indore report only to change the mind, please? <laughs> was the Indore, Indore report only a report or something was implemented? Because this was a principality and the prince or the king was an enlightened one. And the same thing for Badawa. Both of them were enlightened princes. I'm afraid I can't give you a very good answer about this. I mean, uh, as, as far as I know, I've talked to Professor Bromley. He said, no, it wasn't actually implemented that way. Like I like said, that some of his ideas, he anticipated the way the city would grow. And then he said that this is what we should do. Like I was telling you about the suburbs, you know, that how you should, you, you should plan. Um, I don't know, it's quite puzzling. Uh, Gettys never went back to Indore again. Although he was in India intermittently for 10 years. Maybe he was just not invited to oversee the plans for the city, so it just remained on paper. But I must tell you about the Indo report, it's in two volumes. The first volume is of course about the city, the second volume is about the university. He was, uh, he for, uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, get this, uh, I didn't make that connection, I should have, that the reason he found India such an exciting place he said, no city can survive without intellectuals. And the university is crucial. Later on, he was also a Zionist. He actually made plans for the, uh, uh, the uh, University of Jerusalem. 
so uh, uh, the second volume of uh, the Indoor Report is about the university. He says if we really want to build the city, then the university plays a crucial role. You should read the report. It's, it's really, really wonderful. Now that it's back in print. There's a question there. So there was a question here also. Yeah, also. We'll ask them. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, hi, I'm uh, Jaydeep Gupta. I work with Micro Mobility. So, I help assist uh, fleets uh, in cities with existing infrastructure for the same. So, I was wondering, uh, with the Gettys views, how would he feel about the impending situation in, globe, in cities around the globe where uh, a few planners argue for, for e bikes uh, for at least getting a few people uh, who are used to just cars to other means of transportation, but a few are not so uh, positive about them. And in overall turning to uh, a more industrial means of transport. Uh, so how would get his feel about that? And also, uh, uh, so even with a car free, uh, let's say a maneuver going all over the world in global cities. So some cities are actually, even planners do it with goodwill. Uh, face problems when there are traffic jams uh, occurring with uh, motorized vehicles because they build some lanes. So how would Chris feel about the, I mean, his, as per his uh, uh, views, how, how would he uh, ad advise, uh, let's say, that the current municipalities to uh, take care of the, uh, the urban clutter and the other problems caused due to uh, micro-mobility and basically the shared mobility expansion? Well, you know, we have all been reading about the so-called pedestrianization of Changi Chow in the newspaper pages. I'm not really sure, but Gaddis would have approved of it totally. Uh, because, uh, I don't know, I'm just guessing. I mean, uh, but certainly pedestrianization, yes. But, I mean, the answer to it, I thought I'd, you know, that he would have said there should be a gradation of roads. The answer is not just the big thoroughfare or the boulevard, which is what planning did modern planning did to, uh, to, to the city. Uh, you would argue that planes should be preserved. If you read colonial uh, reports on uh, Indian cities, all lanes are pejoratively uh, dubbed as slums. And he, you know, and all housing together. With so you would say, no, we need to preserve this also. So he would have I think so. I, mean, I can't guess, but the point is that what he would say about cities today um, is that uh, there should be a gradation of roads, and uh, it can work. You know, I mean, big thoroughfares for me big mechanized transport, metro mobility, as you say, but also space for pedestrians. I'm not very sure the entire pedestrianization of the city would meet, uh, meet Gettys' approval at all. He was he was quite he was quite a modernist in some ways, and uh, you know he was not a romantic that way. But I I, I don't know whether I'm going to answer your question. question for me, but so, but also concerned to uh, specifically like uh, scooters, the standing scooters and e-bikes, uh, the shared model which has been taking shape around the city mm -hmm. globally. So uh, that's. Uh, that's that's something which uh, some pedestrians also have a problem with actually. Mm -hmm. Me, but it's uh, it's actually pulling people out of the car. So uh, yeah. so that that is something which uh, I mean it needs more attention probably. Uh, yeah. In terms of uh, how you are able to satisfy the, both the parties, as you said, yeah. like uh, this model is actually implementable. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I was wondering, like, from that perspective, how, how would you uh, bring them together uh, yeah. to a possible, let's say, consensus or something close to it? Mm -hmm. Connected to his question, are you aware of anything he's written about the um, relationship between pedestrians and human portage, like you mentioned? Mm -hmm. You know, the hand-drawn, the rickshaws and all pulled by humans. I think this would be contemporaneous to what he's trying to ask for the present time that you know you have these shared autos and self-driven yeah. kind of vehicles. So did he have op any opinion about whether those should be segregated or should pedestrians and human portage all sort of happen at the, in the same street? No. Yeah, so 
you, you, I mean, I mean, you, you have, you know the answer. I mean, basically, what he noticed was that there was this mixed traffic. Yes. You know, all, especially in the big cities and towns. The answer to that was not to mechanize transport. You know, I mean, uh, he would have, he was for mechanized transport. In fact, by the way, he was a great champion of modern technology. I didn't even come to that. Um, uh, absolutely great champion of modern technology. Sometimes disturbingly so. I find it problematic. But uh, what he said that uh, that for the city to work, for the city to work and the, the organicity of that city to be preserved, we need to have different forms. So we don't do have, we, 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 we don't, we don't, uh, we should not have cars in lanes, or we should not do away with lanes. Let the lanes be there, let the, let people walk, and then we can have different grades, gradations of roads. And that's how planning should work. That was not happening. Basically all the lanes were being condemned as slums and big thoroughfares being. I think you wanted to ask. Two questions actually. One was, uh, you mentioned uh, his uh, his affinity for uh, Ebenezer uh, Howard, uh, who was associated with Garden Cities. My impression is, I could be completely wrong here, is that at least in England, Garden Cities didn't work very well. That they were made, but they were widely regarded as a kind of urban disaster. Uh, so I just had a question about whether there's a particular affinity that Geddes has with lost causes, you know, <laughs> what this actually tells us about him. The second question was that you interestingly trailed uh, <coughs> one possible explanation for Geddes' relative obscurity, which you said was his falling out to the left or his inability to capture the imagination of the left. I find that an interesting observation. It's slightly odd, given the fact that the histories of planning and uh, the administration of planning isn't generally or even mainly done by the left. Why would we blame the left, such as it is, for Yedis's obscurity? So let me answer the second question first. I hinted at it right in the beginning when I talked about Charles Correa. So, uh, so the left. Actually, one should call it the left. But anyway, modern planning, which is progressive, socially progressive, uh, always talked about rationalized spaces. Uh, uh, and uh, which, as I said, had completely done away with small, the norms of small communal spaces in, in neighborhoods. So it would be ideal, if you look at the plans of Le Corbusier and his housing <coughs> for the working classes, they're all you know, condominiums. Uh, Gettys didn't have, didn't want that at all. That was not his model. He said, "This just can't work." You know, that was one. That's what I meant when I said that. So even Korea uh, didn't find affinity with it. And as I said, that for Gettys, this kind of uh, housing for the poor, however good it was and progressive in terms of ideology, was still an imposition. He said, "But the model for." Uh, communal living and humane forms of space already exist in our cities, in Indian cities. Why don't we revive them? That was the point that you were saying. Your first question was lost causes and... Uh, no, garden cities. Garden cities, okay, that's very interesting. The irony of modern planning is, as you know, that the subtitle to Ebenezer Howard's book uh, is Garden Cities, colon, a peaceful path to social reform. Garden cities were meant for the working classes, for a quiescent working class. This was a political project. All planning is political, by the way. So Gettys' affinity comes there. Gettys also wanted this. He didn't choose the past part of Marxist revolution. And uh, so this was, so as you know, the modern planning, the history, and we have, we have to confront this in modern planning, that it really is based on two things, all modern planning. How do you make the city uh, more conducive to business? We can call it capitalism. A, B, the bane of capitalism. How do you deal with the working classes? These are the two principal questions of urban planning, even today. Gettys was actually trying to answer them, some of these questions. 
The irony of the garden city model is that they were quickly adopted by the upper classes. It was a huge success. Uh, so we know not as working class communities, but uh, what is that very famous place in London? Uh, where London Gardens. Yeah. Not, <coughs> not, no, no, not Bellman, uh, where the, it's a, the upper middle class. Uh, Hampstead. Hampstead. Hampstead, yes. Hampstead is the <coughs> success story of the garden city model, but what an irony. It's for the upper classes. This was the greatest garden city in the world. Guess what? We are sitting right here. <laughs> what an irony. So Sir, uh, a mic is here. Sir, so my name is uh, Ankaj uh, uh My question is very basic. Uh, sir, uh, town planning with sanitary principles means what? Uh, sorry, town planning with? Sanitary principles. Sanitary in, in principles. In your presentation, you mentioned about that. I would like to know. Okay. I wasn't talking about sanitary principles. Sanitary principles are very important for all cities. I'm talking about sanitarians who believe that cities should be cleansed. So their model was one of pathology, which is that the city produces dirt, produces odor, it produces disease. And to control this, we need a model. And the model was, uh, uh, modern sanitarians produced the model, and this was because of mo developments in modern medicine also, uh, incidentally, it was medicine that played a very big part in modern medical, which is that uh, the way to clean the city would be uh, how to treat waste, and be also to create uh, uh, sort of empty spaces. These empty spaces were not, not just parks, but very big thoroughfares, roads. If you have the circulation of air, then the city will become clean. So this was the model. The classic example of this is, and hugely successful, is uh, Haussmann's plan for Paris. Right? It's very beautiful, but you know this was the thinking behind it. That is what I meant by the sanitary principle. And Geddes was completely against this kind of thing. Because the social and financial costs were huge. Question on uh, your this topic of technology and and Gettys and uh, so I, I think this this piece that there, there is uh, Tim Berner Lee uh, the inventor of the modern web he refers to Paul Otlet and there's Paul Otlet and correspondence with Gettys which is quite uh, very very distinct so the the contribution of Gettys to the creation of the modern internet actually is is the uh, you know in terms of that grid which we haven't spoken about workplace and citizenship. Yeah. To, to me, it seems like that grid which, you know, when, when he said, when he did a presentation, people got bored and walked out of it. That particular grid that where he has emotions built into it, the balance between culture and nature, that lens with which he continued to look at the city for the first time in his life, and then it seems that aren't we limiting the definition of, of uh, you know, uh, planning uh, and uh, seeing it from the point of view of architecture, when the real lens with which, uh, you know, Geddes always looked at the city was employment. Right? Mm -hmm. So he looked at employment, whether it's the Banya who, who's doing this or the Marwadi. In, so his, the lens with which he ob first observed and then his survey was always geared towards measurement of employment to a large extent, understanding it, then seeing the, the natural surroundings around. So the, the, the rural and the urban boundaries were broken. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece, which is to do with folk or citizenship, to do with ethnicity. So he's always seeing things from the point of view of this. The, the, the big elephant in the room, which is work or employment or jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's the lens with which he saw the city and he stayed consistent in this model. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think to a large extent, uh, you know, his contribution is, is understated uh, because if you see his impact on technology side here, mm -hmm. and on the other side, his other friend with whom he has correspondence, which is a recluse, mm -hmm. uh, the anarchist, the geography. Right? The geography. Mm -hmm. Because what is the recluse impact? I mean, it's literally the GIS GPS that we're using today mm -hmm. The impact of recluse, and you see what he's done on India, the maps that recluse made. Mm -hmm. And then again, there is underlying it, there is a Geddes threat. Which, mm -hmm. So Paul Otlet and 
recluse. Uh, and there, so I, I'm referring to that grid which, uh, which Get is uh, always used. And then there is also a comic now that we, you know, recently, I don't know if you've seen this, Sister Nivedita's correspondence with, uh, with uh, uh, Geddes, mm -hmm. where there's even Vivekananda's comment. And it, that's again to do with the grid on culture and nature. Mm -hmm. I think, we, uh, you know, that, that's like epistemology. Mm -hmm. uh, do you get that sense, mm -hmm. the contribution on technology and uh, the focus on, on work as an employment, mm -hmm. as the guiding light? You know, you should do the next talk. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I agree with you. I didn't touch on this at all. At all, yeah, because yeah, you, know, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, everything could be done, but, sure. uh, but really, seriously, I mean, what you're saying is really very, very interesting. This one, another part of Geddes, which we really need to explore. And uh, yes, he must note down. <laughs> okay, a tentative uh, comment and then a suggestion, perhaps. The comment is that you acknowledge right at the start of the talk that this is sympathetic. It would be interesting to know, you did end it with one critical comment, but it would be interesting to know what is the fallacy, because as I see it now, it's all very rosy, and you know, something that one can get seduced by very easily. But is it as rosy as it is? And the suggestion or com uh, would, and on which I would like everybody's comment is that uh, a person that comes to my mind all through this was Jane Jacobs. And that has been romanticized very highly. In fact, uh, not just in US or New York or wherever, but even in cities like Mumbai, there are Jane Jacobs clubs, which citizens have initiated and all. So is there a possibility of us romanticizing Gettys and having sort of a Gettysian kind of movement or whatever, something of that sort? I mean, it is an appropriation and it also links to that Think of his going into obscurity, which was probably a context of uh, you know, a result of the context of times of his own affiliations or whatever. But had Giddies existed today in the day and age of social media, I have a feeling that it could have, you know, he would have had his legion of followers. <laughs> I think you've, you've answered my, your question. <laughs> well, I don't know what to say, <laughs> really. Uh, yeah, there is a danger of his. Work being you know, it's being romanticized. But actually, Geddes, I find it uh, interesting. Um, the, I find Geddes' work very political. Mm -hmm. So one can engage with it, you know. And he certainly needs to be qualified, and there's no doubt about it. And I told you right in the beginning that he is roots, I mean, and there are so many of his ideas which have just don't work. And um, I've, of course, only taken the ones which seem uh, sort of, and there are many other ideas, as Rajneesh pointed out, are, which really need to be revived. Um, but I think there is um, some scope for the small scale. And he at least shows the way you could work with it. And that's very important, I think. It's, um, by the way, I forgot to mention, um, you know, in my own professional life, I now teach cultural histories, actually the history of music. And one thing which happens, and I teach it all the time, that the disciple eclipses the teacher. In the case of Geddes, uh, the same thing happened. Actually, the person who really took forward his ideas was the great Louis Mumford. You know, so Mumford actually eclipses uh, Geddes, and it happens. Hindustani classical music, the disciple often, you know, is more important, <laughs> becomes more famous than the, the teacher. We could think about that also. That's for something that happened to Geddes also. That's supposed to be the mark of a great teacher. Yeah. Yes. And uh, if I also wanted to, I hadn't brought this up, but if I may, it has some relevance to what you're saying, that Geddes was uh, started the Department of Sociology yes. of the University. Yes. He was the, f it, it, the department was created for him. Mm -hmm. He was the first chair mm -hmm. of sociology yes. in Bombay. Mm -hmm. Bombay. Mm -hmm. And you, the, you, there is a book, I don't know if you've seen the book, The Art of Tower, yes. and Essays in the Memory of Patrick Gates, yes, yes, which yes. in 50 years had passed, I think 75 yes. years. Yes, I don't know. Which I think you the book. Yeah. Yes, 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 and it's full of I often thought that one of Geddes' greatest contributions was not in terms of the plans that he implemented, but in terms of the people he taught. And we do 
don't know what they did, but a lot of the people who taught at Bombay University, I always imagine, must have gone on mm -hmm. in, and worked in municipalities and things like that. And then, uh, because it seems that Genesis <coughs> ideas were so close to uh, ordinary people that when they would be put into action, you wouldn't notice in terms of you know social media or anything like that, in terms of the popular media, what it was. And I think that's one part of Kevis, which Bombay, Bombay University, I did find out there is one person in Bombay University, uh, what was his name? Munshi, who who's, who'd been doing a study on, on Kevis. She was from Bombay University, and she was looking at the uh, work in, in the Department of Sociology. I don't know where she is. I've, I've got a reference on that. She did good talk to me also. So uh, I have to tell you this, that um, partly also to answer to Ratnesh's thing. The thing is that I have to say I haven't quite got a grip on the sociology. I found it a bit, prob you know, so I really need to work on that a bit. Uh, the kind of sociology that Geddes did, he called it civics. Uh, not the civics that we do in our STEM <laughs> textbooks. <laughs> It was a kind of activist sociology. And, uh, but in sociological thought, this I can tell you, it has taken a back seat. Um, it happened when the great French sociologists became important. So this professor I mentioned, Professor Ray Bromley, has written a whole book on, it's called Engaging Sociology, looking at the roots of British sociology. In, there's a whole, it's uh, on Geddes and what it really means. About Bombay, I have to tell you this, again about politics, that the person who uh, uh, came after Geddes as the professor of sociology was Gurir. He hated Geddes. <laughs> sort of that Geddes, all of Geddes' work disappeared. Uh, you know, he wrote a polemic against him and said that, that's all I know. Uh, but uh, I think Rambua has written on this. So it's, uh, Gurir also hated Bahir. So he effectively killed uh, the Gettys and shot. About Get, past the mic. About Gettys, uh, gradation of the roads we talked about. The place where it seems to have been done most prominently, gradation of the roads, is Chandigarh. Do you find something common between the two? Well, it's that's not a. As I said, it's not a. Uh, it's not a particularly Gettysian idea. Uh, it's there in, 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 the, uh, in Ebenezer Howard's uh, Garden Cities. It's there, lots of people were talking about it at one point, that if you have smaller cities, uh, smaller communities, then obviously people would also walk, yes. and you need safe places to walk. So lanes were in fact coming up. Coming up. And then you of course mechanized transport. And yes. So Kabuz, and Kabuz did, you know, also plugged into this in a big way. Lots of planners did. In the case of, uh, what Geddes was trying to say is for cities that already exist, like say Calcutta, which mm -hmm. were teeming big metropolises, he said the planning model seems to be to do away with lanes and only have big thoroughfares. He said that will not work. That's why he said let's have, let's preserve the lanes, have mm -hmm. sort of middle roads, you know, where we can have mixed traffic, and we should have thoroughfares where we have only mechanized traffic because they do need to move fast. Geddes was not against mechanized traffic at all. Did he meet uh, Gandhi? Did, did he we met Gandhi him? once. Uh, there was a here in 1917 when he was in Indore. It's uh, there in the Bible. Yeah, he's, he's part of the audience. He actually corresponds in a letter with the. Those he, there was a Hindi conference. He actually offered to work. He he he's wanted partnership with Gandhi, but Gandhi said I'm too busy. But I have, uh, I have not got the quote here, I have it somewhere. He was slightly skeptical of Gandhi. Yeah, yeah he wasn't quite. His real friends were Tagore and Jagdish Bose. Uh, last question, I think, hopefully. <laughs> Since you mentioned Tagore, and you also mentioned that uh, uh, that he, the second part of his Indore report was actually about the university. Uh, Shantini Ketan was coming up at that time. So can you shed some light on what was his role in 
shaping Shanti Niketan as a university? Was he involved in the planning process of the? No, I don't think so. But uh, uh, frankly, I really don't know. No, I, 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 I know a little bit about it. Yeah. Yeah, the, the correspondence that we read. So, so there is actually at Shanti Niketan, there is uh, a, a correspondence between Tagore and uh, Geddes. Uh, and there's also a beautiful diagram, you can actually catch it on the internet, where, uh, so there is uh, the concept of a city museum, which is a five-story perspective tower, which uh, Geddes has built at Edinburgh, which you can still see. And, uh, and Tagore actually, uh, and he exchanged ideas about it, that what's the model of a city museum? So even a semi-literate, uh, you know, a person living in that city should know his history. So on the top floor, there's Edinburgh history, and then on the second one, there is the British Empire. Then it used to be the, uh, the third floor was the critical one. That, uh, so, uh, sorry, the third one was of world history. The fourth one was about the language of, uh, the history of languages. So it made you think, in what language are you thinking? And then the last one is about, uh, you know, uh, planet Earth as, uh, and how significant or insignificant it, its role is in the cosmos. So by the time you come out, your perspective has changed. So that's the perspective tower, right? And Tagore liked this concept, that this is the concept of a city museum, that you have the local city history, and by the time you come out, your nazaria has changed, or your perspective has changed. Yeah, so, so it, it gelled with this concept of, uh, you know, that motto of Vishwabharati, that, you know, uh, global citizenship over nationalism. And this particular model, uh, so this is documented between the, the correspondents. Unfortunately, that tower was bombed, and its model is somewhat changed, but it exists in Edinburgh today. Uh, so you still have the top floor, but after that, you know, it's a titillation of the senses as you move out. So it's still a very interesting museum, but uh, the it's it's the discussion between the two of them is around, this is uh, what should be ideal as a city model. And remember that Tagore at that time is thinking of this as a model for a city <coughs> museum to, to come. Yeah, so it never saw the light of day, uh, but uh, the, the, it's documented. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I just wanted to ask you Geddes uh, did uh, talk, discuss in lengthy letters what the plan for the university should be. And uh, there's masses of stuff, and it led to their getting a bit estranged, actually, because De Gaulle felt that he was going off at the deep end and he couldn't quite see eye to eye with him. And the Outlook Tower idea, of course, yeah. it's called the Outlook Tower, Outlook Tower. perspective tower. In Edinburgh, of course, was one that he probably responded to. But uh, he did a lot of work on that and on Osmania University. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, he had, it, apart from Indoor, there were these also that he was interested in. And uh, Edward uh, Geddes' co correspondence has been printed yeah. now. Basha B. Fraser has edited, so you can just get a copy. Madhurima, uh, I am a planner uh, and uh, also a researcher. Uh, my subject of research is uh, inclusive cities. I just wanted to know, uh, you know, based on your experience of, of course, Geddes and also looking at the kind of uh, development that has been happening in the Indian cities, how hopeful are you uh, for the Indian cities uh, in terms of uh, you know, we have this whole uh, two-way process, like we have the bottom-up approaches. I mean, if we translate Gaddis's uh, get, get ideas and also the ideas of the new urbanism group of people and, you know, people who all, you know, built over these uh, principles. So if we all, you know, club them into the bottom-up approaches and, of course, the traditional um, town planning concepts as the, you know, top-down approaches, uh, and whatever experimentation that our Indian cities in terms of planning has been having, how hopeful are you uh, that, uh, you know, the bottom-up approaches could scale up to a level that we could at least, you know, if not 100%, uh, you know, s see our Indian cities growing in a right direction in the future? Or have we lost the time or have we lost the bus? Um, or do we really have hopes? <laughs> we have lost all this. We have. <laughs> well, all I can say, I really don't know, but what I'm saying is that Geddes had a method, a kind of working method, as I said, not a method per se, which is the survey method. If we do survey, I think all, all cities are different. The same 
model can't work, even if it's the bottom up approach. So you, somebody will have to do this ensemble of work, both you know, walking around the city, collecting the material, putting the material together, and see what picture emerges, and only then do the planning. That doesn't happen. In fact, it, I mean, the, the story of planning that you read in the planning textbooks is what? It's called Lucia looking at an empty sheet of paper and saying, voila, and he lists sort of the plans. Or even Latin Latins said that he would come to Delhi or something and that he could just plan it. So that uh, won't work. So Geddes' model, even if the kind of ideas don't work, some of his ideas I don't think would probably work now, but the survey method I think still has a great potential. And survey doesn't just mean walking around the city, it means an ensemble, it means a team working together. Yeah, like for example, if, uh, uh, I mean the TOD model has been taken up quite, I mean whatever are the implications or the implementational issues, but they have, it has been taken up seriously by quite a, a few cities now, even the, at the government level. Yeah. It, is, it is being experimented and uh, within the TOD we do see principles of, uh, you know, Pedestrianization, uh, densification, yeah. all these aspects. Uh, and also, there are these different indexes which uh, the government is trying to make. Uh, it has its own shades of politics and other things, but we are, we are talking about livability index. Now, we are talking about inclusive cities index. So, there are these efforts that I personally see coming up from the uh, top down you know, uh, people uh, in the cities. And you know, ultimately what I personally have seen is that the bottom-up approaches really work well at that scale, you know, and, and at that level. But at after a point, you know, they need to fit into the city scale. Otherwise, that gap will always has what has been remaining will always remain. So there, there has to be this bridging of the bottom and bottom up and the top down. Without that, we would not be able to see it at the city level. So do you think the effort, of course they are no, less. I agree with you, I completely agree with you. I think it's a... Little uh, shades of, you know, I think so that we are picking up, but I don't know if we are late. The idea, the reason I gave this talk was that some of the ideas that we yes. work with, whether top down or bottom up, some of them are actually Gedesian ideas. All That's I want true. you to do is to acknowledge it, that Gedes <laughs> was thought about it. Whether he was right or wrong is another, you know, we can debate. Well, I think, uh, time to thank you for what you've been oh, it's it is of course significant that uh, there are a lot of as I, as I might say secrets of planning which you have exposed not being a planner whereas uh, you know what you're talking about is planning There is, of course, another very important, surprisingly, planners here, just to talk about it, the survey method of Geddes, which you're quite right, it is the most significant planning tool Delhi talks about. Very much underrated, of course, amongst planners. Uh, the, there was in the 60s, or the 70s, 60s, uh, another very important, similar uh, thing was done, but it much larger scale by another Scotsman uh, called Ian McHarl, who started the uh, in, 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 in the Philadelphia, the University of Pennsylvania, the landscape department, and is perhaps the first ecological planner in the world. So the entire approach of, of uh, McHarl was to, uh, about doing uh, several layers of analysis from surveys. But this is all modern stuff, okay. you know. And he was doing it for regional planning on the largest possible scale. So it's very interesting that, you know, so many years later, 50, 60 years later, mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps to my mindset, the, uh, uh, ecological planning is the hope of the future, as a matter of fact. And it, it also relies on the survey. The Khan surveys are extraordinarily But the TOD and all, you see, the 20th century has been completely overrun by traffic and transportation. And uh, I think human mobility has become our greatest curse today. 
but that's my view. And, uh, so, <laughs> another question? Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Karan. Um, I'm a student. I'm also sort of studying planning. Um, I, there were a couple of things that sort of stuck out to me in your talk. Number one, about his sort of run-in with the left, or at least what we would imagine, um, and the idea of uh, his, his work being political and yet having a year to the ground and yet not being implemented. It seems to me that he was sort of this political centrist in a way, and, when, and the idea of bottom up and top down. Um, it, it seems like there is a weird contradiction in that when you're saying that he has an affinity for Ebenezer Howard uh, and his Garden Cities of Tomorrow, if you if you see Garden Cities of Tomorrow, it's almost like this proto-modernist cleansed space, which is full of you know it's it's, it's about geography, it's about these sanitized spaces, and even in that, uh, Ebenezer Howard talks about you know there is a plan and it can be superimposed and sort of put in different uh, places around the world, and at the same time. It, it seems Geddes is advocating for a very bottom-up kind of approach because of the year that he has to the ground. Uh, you also mentioned he was a Zionist, uh, so he's working in Jerusalem. How, how do you make sense of these weird contradictions? And also the fact that he, his student is Lewis Mumford, and then we know the legacy of Mumford with, uh, with the spatialization of sort of capital and the production of space, uh, where Lefebvre was talking about something later on. David Howey talks about these things, about the production of space, and how capital determines these things. It seems like Geddes is almost at the weird junction between these two large movements. So how do you make sense of that contradiction? Well, the contradictions exist. Um, I don't think there's any, uh, uh, there, lots of progressive thinkers in the early 20th century were Zionists, right? I mean, because they saw it as a new community coming up. I don't think Geddes would have approved of what's happened to Palestine. There's no question, I mean, there's no question about that. I mean, I think um, he was very excited about being able to build a new university there, although, although that was also not implemented really. Um, we'll have a conversation on the Ebenezer model uh, later. I mean, I mean, this is not the place to do it, but the point is that uh, well, Ebenezer's, uh, Ebenezer Howard's model is, uh, you know, now in the post-colonial way, we look at it as a kind of, if you look at the drawing of it, it seems like a panoptic. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But it's not actually. I think it's a mistake to read Ebenezer Howard like this. You should read Lewis Mumford's introduction to the Garden Cities, which is right. a, yeah, then you get a sense of, we tend to read, uh, sometimes we tend to overread plans, uh, interesting plans from the Foucauldian angle. It, it's not quite like that. My reading is that it's, it was quite flexible, quite interesting. But it was a political model nonetheless, more, you know, Ebenezer Howard. So there's an irony to this, I point out. But we'll have a discussion on it. <laughs> I think it's getting late. Yeah, they're, they're lapping up the, uh, the support system. <laughs> <laughs> So, but really, thank you very much, Partho. I think that's all that needs to be said. It's been a very interesting uh, talk, and uh, we'll have to get you to talk to Brandon as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>